of the Lost World of Genesis 1, Ancient Cosmology and the Origins Debate. My name is Kurt Willems, and I'm kind of going to guide you through this uh, tour of the book. Um, and I am at thepangeablog.com. So obviously, this is a book all about Genesis 1. And our author, John Walton, is an expert on Old Testament. He's actually a professor of Old Testament at Wheaton College. Well, here's an image to start us off. And I was curious to just ask, what does this bring to mind? It's ridiculous, it's stupid, it's Homer Simpson, for goodness sake. He's scratching his butt, he's eating in a banana, and you're thinking to yourself, well, for Homer Simpson, I can buy evolution. But maybe you're more of the persuasion that real evolution is heresy. And so keep that in your mind as we tour. What are your assumptions that you're bringing to the subject? Here's a second image. Maybe this describes your understanding of origins, that there's this truth that must destroy Darwinian evolution. Does this give you an accurate picture of your view of the origins of our world? A third image. Fish don't walk and Jesus still lives. Is this your car by chance? Because I think it might be getting towed in the parking lot. I think, though, it is safe to say that Christians are in the midst of a culture war. And the bottom line question of the book that we are looking at is, is this mostly a cultural issue or is this culture war actually a biblical one? Which the conviction of many Christians is, yes, indeed it is. Well, here's his thesis. He says throughout the entire Bible, there is not a single instance in which God revealed to Israel a science beyond their own culture. The little structure of the book looks like this. There are 18 propositions, and by propositions, they're just arguments that um, he's putting forward, and they're very short, usually between three and six or so pages, and um, you're going to be delighted because even if you disagree with his view, he's such a good writer that his argument just flows very naturally, and you'll get through this book probably in one or two sittings. So here's the theology of the author. The bottom line question, I think, in the book is, do we hold to material or functional ontology? So let's talk about what does that mean, ontology, big words. So let's, let's unpack it a little bit. Material ontology is the belief that something exists by virtue of its physical properties and its ability to be experienced by the senses. My guess is you're sitting in a chair or some kind of chair-like device, maybe a couch, um, and maybe that's an image that we can grab a hold of, right? Literally, you can touch your chair, you can feel it, it can be experienced. It is a material reality. So our worldview is typically something where we look at materiality and we say it exists because it's real, we can touch it. Now functional ontology, functional views of reality are a little different. The ancient world believed that something existed by virtue of its having function in an ordered system. Well, what does that mean? I mean, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? But let's think of a grocery store. You know, the question might be for us, when does a grocery store actually become a store? You know, there's been a lot of construction in my city. And down the block, there's been um, the store that's been going up. And I don't know what store it is, but let's just imagine that it's a Bonds or an Albertsons. You know, there's a foundation that'll be laid. There's going to be some walls that go up. And the question is, like, when does it actually become a grocery store? Is it a grocery store when there's slabs of concrete and some walls? Well, I'm not too sure. Maybe it's a grocery store when the sign will finally be displayed so people know, oh, that's going to be a place where I can eventually get groceries. Well, it doesn't really function as a grocery store if there's no food in it. So maybe if we took our argument a bit further, we'd say, okay, so when the aisles are in place, so you know where to get your sugar and where to get your milk and where to get your eggs and all of the various things that you're going to want, then it's kind of like a grocery store. But I want to argue that maybe a grocery store isn't actually functional as a grocery store until the first customer comes in because the employees are now in place, the Food is in place, the products are in place, and now the customer can come in, make their purchases, and it functions for the benefit of who? The customer. 
A grocery store does not become functional when the building materials finally come together to make a storefront. It becomes a functional store when the employees are in place to make the building function so that it's stocked with food and ready for customers. I hope you're getting the picture here, the difference between material and functional views of reality. Let's keep looking at this. <clears throat> functional ontology creates an ordered system. An ordered system being like a grocery store. There is a system for the sake of the customer. This is what John Walton says. He says, I do not refer to an ordered system in scientific terms, but an ordered system in human terms. That is, in relation to society and culture. In this sort of functional ontology, the sun does not exist by virtue of its material properties or even by the function as a burning ball of gas. Rather, it exists by virtue of the role that it has in its sphere of existence, particularly in the way that it functions for humankind and human society. In a functional ontology, to bring something into existence would require giving it a function or a role in an ordered system rather than giving it material properties. Consequently, something could be manufactured physically, like a grocery store, but still not exist if it has not become functional. I think you're really, hopefully, starting to at least grasp his argument. And he's basically saying, in the ancient world, this is how they viewed reality and existence. It had nothing to do with materials. It had everything to do with the organization of those materials for a purpose. So big idea number one. Genesis 1 is a text about functional origins. Now this would be consistent with the ancient Near Eastern worldview and all of the uses of the word bara, create, in the Hebrew Bible. Bara is never used to describe material origins in scripture. This does not negate the reality that God did create those materials. But the Genesis 1 really isn't about that. It describes God organizing reality to function for human image bearers. Now, I know this is maybe messing with some of your understandings of um, creation, and it should because we've held a much different view for so long. I want to make something very clear that it does not negate the reality that God did in fact create as we understand creation. And there's, view, there's verses in the New Testament that attest to this. So do not get worried. We're not denying the creation ability of God. We're asking a different question. Here's the big idea number two that's really important. Cosmic temple inauguration. Okay, so in the ancient Near East, a deity was expected to dwell restfully in a temple. Okay, now the cosmos in this view is God's universal temple. This is backed up by other Old Testament passages that he argues very persuasively with. Now the functional arrangement of the cosmos for seven days parallels a seven-day inauguration ceremony for a tabernacle or a temple. So after setting up the, quote, temple to function for humanity, God takes residence in it to run the world. So God's resting is this active activity. It's not rest like he's just taking a nap. He's not tired. He's God. But he is making his presence real in the temple so that everything functions now that it's all been set up and God's been resting ever since. When the deity rests in the temple, it means that he is taking command, that he is mounting to his throne to assume his rightful place and his proper role. So, continuing this idea, God took the chaos of prehistoric evolutionary materials and organized them to function with order, which he called very good. The seven days are God's assigning functions to the cosmic temple to work for human image bearers. God's world is now a place where God rests and humanity functions as his care providers for the earth. So what are some insights and application here? We're going to truck through these. Genesis 1 is the moment in the history of God's ongoing creation of materials in the world when he intervened to set up the cosmos as his functional temple for the benefit of humankind, who, for the first time, were branded with his divine image to become higher 
and all of the animals. Genesis 1, when read this way, allows us to embrace what science seems to tell us about material origins because, for goodness sake, in this view, this text is all about functional origins. So evolution and creation are no longer at war with each other. The battle is done. Let's wave our white flags and let's move forward in some productive dialogue about the kingdom of God. It does beg a big question, though, about Adam. Was he created functionally by being chosen out of all the other maybe homo erectuses of the day from the evolutionary material process? Did humanity come from common ancestors who would eventually bear the image of God? It's the idea that God created in the sense that we're used to the word until the right time, and then he set up these functions, and he took a man from out of all of the animals, and he said, you are going to be my image bearer. We can look at the book for a little bit more of an argument in that direction. Another application here is for us. What does Sabbath mean, right? If God rests how we used to understand it on the Sabbath, then resting here as work, it doesn't really connect. So if rest for God is him at work running the cosmos, then our Sabbath rest can be seen in a new light. When we rest on the Sabbath, we recognize him as the author of order and the one who brings rest, stability to our lives and world. We take our hands off the controls of our lives and acknowledge him as the one who is in control. Most importantly, this calls on us to step back from our workaday world, those means by which we try to provide for ourselves and gain control of our circumstances. Wow. Are you ready for that? Okay, let's continue. Scholarly advancement. The functional temple reading demonstrates that two main schools of thought have either gone too far or not far enough. Too far. Seven-day creationists um, and even the old-age creationists. Here's the deal. They fail to read Genesis 1 as an ancient, and we all know that it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, ancient document. They impose material ontology onto the text. So instead of knowing that in the ancient world it was all about functional ontology, they're imposing this material worldview that really is foreign to the world of the scriptures at least in the Old Testament. Looks for scientific info about origins that simply is not there, and thus create a false polarity between evolution and scripture. They go too far. Who goes not far enough? Well, this is the literary approach, the framework theory as it's popularly known as. You know, this is the idea that um, Genesis 1 is this poetic expression of big theological idea. It tends to reduce Genesis 1 to literary theological expressions, and the risk here is reductionism. Walton says it this way, theory, the theory in this book does not require them to discard that interpretation, but only to accept the functional perspective alongside of it. So, Another thing is the Cosmic Temple Inauguration View puts forward a perspective that other theologians can build off of to further improve their interpretations. I want to give you one last thought. This is my thought. I don't know. Maybe other people have thought of this, but um, it just kind of came to me as I read this book. Is that I think there's huge ramifications for understanding the new creation um, if we understand a functional ontology. You see new creation as expressed in Isaiah 65 and elsewhere, Romans 8, Revelation 21, really becomes about God restoring order or shalom functionally rather than replacing this cosmos with the brand new materials. You know, the argument always goes, is this world going to be destroyed and remade like literally a brand new heaven and a brand new earth? Or is this about cosmic renewal? And I think this argument continues to push us towards this idea that new in the New Testament, new heaven, new earth, does not mean brand new, but it means new in function, renew. I think this totally deconstructs the old thought that this world is going to be destroyed. It was functional in the beginning, and it's going to be functional in the end. Well, thank you for um, hanging out. I hope you'll read this book, and um, I hope that uh, it's been informative for you.